Hello, Angela. Hi, Lisa. How are you? Sorry about that. I'm uh, I'm not very good with Facebook. You know what? Then we're a, we're a sad pair because <laughs> I'm not either. The first time I did this, it took us 15 minutes to figure out how to get um, our guest on. We had Dr. Demert uh, a few months ago, the chief investigator for um, the lead investigator for the Moderna trial here at GW, the trial I'm in. So uh, he, he answered lots of questions. So, but thanks so much for taking time to show up. And uh, we have quite a few questions for you. I don't know if you saw some of the questions in the comments, but. I did not only because I was frantically Googling how to join a Facebook live event. <laughs> <laughs> Great, no problem. So uh, we're all friendly here. You know, I heard you on NPR and that's what uh, compelled me to reach out to you. Because my work, you know, my background is in infectious diseases and public health, but I've become a community activist and I'm really passionate about health literacy. And one thing I noticed is that uh, researchers, medical folks like me, we tend to talk at a language higher than what people understand. And I'm very committed to plain speak and trying to help people understand uh, what we're talking about so that they can make informed decisions. And I think the vaccine, the choice to get vaccinated is one of those decisions that definitely needs to be informed, but there's so much misinformation. And I don't hear people talking about it at a level I think people can, that, that makes it very accessible. But when I heard you on NPR, I thought, oh, I've got to talk to her. So I'm really grateful that you uh, responded. Well, it's my pleasure. And I, I'm right there with you. I think that probably the biggest problem um, that we've had during this pandemic, or one of the biggest problems, is just the inability of many scientists and medical providers to really communicate with the general public. And it's really hard to engage the public in the enterprise of public health, which of course requires their engagement. If you can't talk to people um, plainly and in a straightforward way that is accessible to everybody. So I'm really, really glad to be here. Um, honored that you reached out to me. Yeah, so, so where are you? I'm in Seattle, Washington right now. Um, this is my office. It's actually a little nook off of our dining room. <laughs> but yeah, um, yeah I'm, in, I'm in Seattle, but I'm uh, institutionally affiliated right now with the Georgetown Center for Global Health Science and Security. Um, next oh, spring- Oh, they're in DC, okay. Yeah, they're in DC. And next spring, I'm actually moving to Canada um, where I'm going to start a new lab um, at Vito Intervac, which is a vaccine research institute um, at the University of Saskatchewan. But for now, um, until I make that move, I'm working remotely uh, from Seattle. Well, congratulations. That's a big deal to have your own lab. I know you lab rats. I know enough about that process, having done a little bit of it during my fellowship, that it's a big deal to have your own lab so you can have the creative freedom to do what you want. So good for you. Oh, thank you so much. Yeah, I'm really excited to, to go work um, actually on vaccines, which is an area that I know a lot about, but up until now, haven't worked on them directly. So I'm really excited about that too. Yeah, so before we jump into the questions, why don't you um, just talk to people about your background, your professional background and why you're someone they should listen to uh, when it comes to vaccine science. Well, so I'm a virologist. Um, I have been, uh, I got my PhD um, from Columbia in 2009, um, did my postdoctoral fellowship at the University of Washington, and this is where I'm from also, Seattle. Um, and then I went back to Columbia, um, where I've been for the past four and a half years. One of the reasons I came back to Seattle was that I was commuting by coastally um, between Seattle and New York, and that was obviously untenable during a pandemic. Um, why people should listen to me, you know, I don't know that they should listen to me more than they should listen to any other scientist, other than that one of the, the things that I'm really passionate about, too, is um, really empowering people with information and trying to break down my field, which is very filled with jargon, um, into something that everybody can understand. Um, as somebody who has worked on emerging viruses and uh, the biological host response to infection, um, I've worked on the past on MERS coronavirus and influenza and Ebola. Um, and now, like most of my colleagues, I'm also working on SARS coronavirus too. I think that, you know, it's really difficult to communicate to people, why is this happening? Like, didn't we know that something like this was going to happen? And the answer is yes. 
Um, we did know about that, but it, the reasons why the pandemic has been uh, impossible to control um, really has a lot more to do with leadership and uh, being able to communicate what's actually going on, um, the importance of being prepared prior to the pandemic, the importance of developing new vaccine technologies, um, and really getting through to people about, you know, the, the need for the public to be part of the public health enterprise. Um, so if any, if there's any reason why people should listen to me as opposed to, you know, some, some random person on Facebook, <laughs> um, is that, uh, you know, my motivation is really to, to help people learn about what's going on so that in the future we can all work together, um, scientists, providers like yourself, as well as um, the public at large to prevent this from happening again. Yeah, I appreciate, I, pre I appreciate you talking about the importance of leadership. People ask me, you know, do I really think it matters who was in the White House when this happened? And the reason I, I would say yes, absolutely, is because the leadership sets the tone and is responsible for ensuring we have a coordinated message and response. And because we've had so many different messages, random messages, people have become confused, um, discouraged. Um, it, it's been far too toxic. You know, there was an, um, I think it was an outbreak of E. coli some, uh, or something recently. And there was no debate about whether or not the food item should have been recalled because that's public health. That's how we handle these situations. And so I think people should recognize that it's really important for us to all get on the same page and talk about this in a unified way. So completely agree. You said you have worked on those vaccines. Those are some pretty sexy vaccines like the Ebola. Um, but tell people, what specifically do you do with vaccines? So I haven't actually worked on vaccines in the past. Um, what I actually have worked with is, are the viruses themselves. And what I do is every time you're infected with a virus, with a pathogen, um, you respond to it. And pathogenesis or the process by which one of these viruses causes disease um, is often really inextricably or always really inextricably intertwined with uh, that response. So sometimes mm -hmm. you might have a response that's good and that clears the viral infection. Um, your immune system will respond in a controlled, measured way and you will recover and be back to, back to normal. Um, other times you will respond in a way that is abnormal and your immune system effectively goes crazy um, and it fails to control the pathogen. And it also actually, those responses are what often cause the disease. And that's true for Ebola virus disease. And it's true for COVID-19 as well. Um, many people have heard about the so-called cytokine storm um, that, that is linked to severe COVID. And basically what that is, is an out of control inflammatory response that is not helpful at actually getting rid of the virus um, but that, that can itself cause the, the more severe consequences of having COVID-19. So um, that's what I, that's the central focus of my research um, is kind okay. of understanding what is the basis, like what causes one person to have a good response versus one person to have a bad response um, and how yeah. that relates to outcome. Okay. So I want to I want to segment our conversation in buckets, um, but I just want to sort of give people a highlight uh, so that an overview. I think we definitely want to talk about messenger RNA, what it is, what it isn't, how it works, how long it stays in your body. But I think before, and this is where I think we go wrong. Before we talk about that, we need to make sure people understand what happens in the body normally. And when yeah. we talk about the body, like you're, we're hearing a lot of discussions about ribosomes and cell, cytoplasm and cells, and we don't expect people to really understand cell biology like we might. So we have to ensure people understand that first, because if you understand what's happening inside the body, what's going on, what is your immune system? What's, what's going on with it? How does it protect you? Once you understand that, then I think it's easier to talk about messenger RNA, what it's doing and why, you know, what the whole situation is with, with that. So first, 
can you just i know it's hard it's it's huge but give people you know a quick primer so that they can understand when we start talking about messenger rna and how it's related to dna so tell people about the cell and what's going on and dna sure i'll try to give my best um quick rundown of how cell biology and molecular biology work um so in your cell um, you have basically three parts of the cell. Um, there is the membrane of the cell. That's You can think of that as the borders of the cell. That's the outside of the cell. Um, so let's back up again. So I think telling people how we get to the cell. So you have me, this person, and I'm made up of organs. And then my organs are made up of tissues. And so you actually have to look underneath the microscope to see beyond that. And that's where you get to cells, right? Or did I miss something in between there? Nope, that's exactly correct. Um, okay, so, so this is where all this, you know, the, the, where the viruses are interacting, they're interacting at the cell level. So it's deep inside the body, places we don't think about, places that are out of sight, out of mind. So I just wanted to plug that. Yeah, no, that's, that's a great point. So all of us, um, I mean, we're looking at each other's cells right now to, to a certain extent. Um, every part of our body is made of cells and things that aren't made of cells like our fingernails or our hair are products of cells. Those are proteins that are secreted by cells. But all of us are made out of uh, organs and those are organized um, or tissues. Those are organized into organs, um, including like our skin, our eyes, et cetera. Um, and those tissues are made up of cells and there's many different kinds of cells. There's specialized skin cells. There are eye cells. There are you know, epithelial cells in our mouths. Um, th there are all different kinds of cells, but they all have the same basic features. And that is they are covered with a membrane. Um, that is the outside of the cell. Uh, then the inside part is called the cytoplasm. Um, and there is a subcompartment in there called the nucleus. And the nucleus is where our DNA is. And DNA, most people know, they've heard of DNA. They know that it might contain genes. Um, genes are basically packets of information. So if you think of this as like architecture, um, the genes would contain the blueprints. Um, when genes are expressed, uh, they are they are called it's called transcription. They are transcribed in the nucleus into a molecule that's very similar to DNA called RNA. And this form of RNA is called messenger RNA or mRNA. Um, that, that's like essentially taking those blueprints and writing out instructions on how to build something. Um, that goes into the cytoplasm. It leaves the nucleus. It goes outside of the nucleus into the, the main part of the cell. Um, and there it is translated um, into protein. And that's like taking those instructions and building a house or a piece of furniture out of it. Um, and the things that do the building are called ribosomes. They are organelles, um, mini organs inside of a cell um, that make protein based on the instructions that are encoded in the messenger RNA. So and that what is- what are those proteins doing though? They do all kinds of things. So they are the proteins that make up your fingernails or your hair. Um, they are enzymes. Uh, they, can, they can cut other proteins. They can cut DNA or RNA. They make up the structure of the cell. Um, they can uh, make, they can transduce signals or relay signals from the surface of the cell, from other cells um, into the nucleus and tell the cell what kind of genes it should be expressing or not. They essentially are ways of communicating uh, between cells. So proteins just do all kinds of different things. Um, and it, that can really depend on what kind of cell it is. Um, so in this case for a vaccine, um, what we're talking about is a protein that your immune system will recognize as foreign and raise immune responses to. So antibodies, um, T cell responses, things like that. Um, antibodies themselves are proteins. So when your body makes antibodies, it's a specialized kind of immune cell called a B cell that makes them. Uh, that's that same process that I just described. The DNA that encodes the antibody gene will uh, make messenger RNA for that antibody that will go out into the cytoplasm and find a ribosome and an antibody protein will be made and excreted from the cell out into the circulation. Um, so that's what's known as the central dogma of molecular biology. 
Um, and it's a, a really fundamental thing that scientists like myself take for granted, um, but that most people don't actually know. If you said the central dogma to, to somebody who doesn't have a science background, they probably would have no idea what you're talking about. Um, yeah, well, there was still a lot of big words in there. Um, so are you saying DNA doesn't know how to express itself without messenger RNA? So yeah. that the messenger RNA has to give in instructions so that the DNA knows what to do or help people with that connection between mRNA and, the, and DNA. Yeah, you can think of this as really um, passing notes. Um, so the mRNA is like a note that gets passed from the nucleus where the DNA is out to the, the outer part of the cell, the cytoplasm. Um, and really what that is, is the DNA can't leave the room that it's in the nucleus. Um, so it needs to be, those instructions have to be relayed uh, to the, the machinery that makes the protein. Um, and that Meth that method of relaying that message is mRNA or messenger RNA. Um, when that protein gets made, as I mentioned, proteins can do all sorts of different things. If you think of the cell as like a little factory, um, that is really the machinery in the factory. That's how, you know, you might have one machine that does, if you think of it as like a mail packaging facility or something, you might have one machine that is putting things into boxes. And then you have another machine that is that is sealing the boxes. And then you have another machine that's putting labels on the boxes and sorting the boxes. Um, that's really what the proteins are doing. They're doing all kinds of different things that the cell needs to do. Um, and different cells will of course have different kinds of proteins uh, depending on what that cell is normally supposed to do. So if you have an eye cell, for example, it's making proteins that are involved in vision and color recognition. If you have uh, an immune cell, maybe it's making antibodies. Um, if you have a skin cell, it's going to be making keratin, which is the, the hard part of your skin and so forth. Um, so yeah. all of these proteins are kind of doing different specialized functions. Um, and I realized that was a lot of metaphors that I no, mixed no, up no. there. No, 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 it's okay. I mean, I'm really harping on this because we really have to make sure people understand what's happening inside their body at the level of where the vaccine and the mRNA is working. And so I need to push a little bit more on this point. So I love the metaphor you gave about the factory or the bot, you know, the one person's doing this with the box. Someone is, let's say it's a foreman who's overseeing the whole process and saying, Angela, you box, Lisa, you tape, you know, to the next person, you're the one who's shipping. Is the messenger RNA like a foreman that's giving instructions to all the different components in the factory? The messenger RNA is more like the messages that the foreman is giving. Um, the foreman's more like the, the, the guy sitting in the nucleus who's not really interacting with anybody else in the factory. Um, he's giving instructions from a, a separate room and the messenger RNA is how those instructions are being given. Okay, so now that we understand messenger RNA's purpose is to give instructions for the body to do whatever. In this case, maybe it's produce antibodies. Before we move on, what are antibodies and what do they do? So antibodies are a specialized type of protein that are made by a specialized immune cell called a B cell. Um, and antibodies, basically their main function is to float around in your blood um, and find something that they, they're looking for their one true match um, to bind. And uh, every antibody has its own it's like special. Dance. Exactly. Um, it has its own special uh, protein that it's supposed to bind to. Um, now, the way that our immune system works, and I'm not gonna get into this because it's incredibly complicated and I don't even completely understand it, but antibodies are specialized to bind something that is foreign. So antibodies don't normally bind proteins that are already being made by your body. They don't bind things that are encoded by your DNA. Um, mm -hmm. they're, they're binding foreign things. So they're binding bacteria, they're binding viruses, they're binding other pathogens um, that, that can cause an infection and getting rid of them. And the purpose of the antibody is to um, either coat the pathogen completely 
or to interfere with something that the pathogen has to do in order to cause an infection. Um, they also will sort of signal um, by binding, they'll signal other parts of your immune system to come in and really kind of clean up the infection overall. So there's a bunch of different players on an immune system, in the immune system. You can think of that sort of like a football team. Um, maybe the antibodies are, are kind of like the secondary. They're running around and tackling people before they can get a touchdown. Um, then you have blockers on the line who are preventing, hopefully, the quarterback on the other team from even getting a pass off. Um, but, but antibodies are really, their goal is to run around and, or float around in your blood and find the one thing that is their true match, um, bind to it so that they can say, hey, this is dangerous. Let's get this out of here um, before it can cause an infection. Yes, excellent. So this, and this is the basis for why we give vaccines because we want to, it's, and I've also heard of the analogy of the lock and the key. So the, the, the antibody has to bind to something um, that it matches with. And if it doesn't, and that's usually our own bodies, right? Yeah, so, well, the antibodies should not bind things in our own bodies. Um, That's because, what I mean. So yeah, if it yeah. doesn't fit, right? So if it doesn't find a match, it means, okay, that's safe. Like this is normal, like this is Lisa. But when, if I come in contact with coronavirus, it recognizes, oh, wow, that's not Lisa. And then it should fit like the lock and the key and then it destroys it or it creates a response to protect me. That's right. So there's a process while, um, anti or while B cells are developing in which um, they sort of, it's like almost testing a bunch of locks with a bunch of keys. And if they find anything that matches um, that belongs to you, those B cells um, will be killed effectively. So you can't make any antibodies that will fit uh, any locks or keys that, that belong to the host, um, or in this case, you. Um, yeah. The only antibodies then that are left behind are antibodies that will randomly fit any other type of lock. Um, if you think of the antibody as the key, I guess, the, the other type of, any other type of lock that comes in will be foreign. And that's how the antibodies um, know uh, that, that this is something that they should respond to. Awesome. Okay, so I think I beat that horse enough. Um, if folks are watching and you still have questions about how the immune system works at the cellular level, um, just leave them below and we'll come back. So now I wanna shift and then talk about messenger RNA. There, there have been videos coming my way, experts proclaiming that it's terrible, uh, they're injecting technology in us, why is it new? I'm sure you've seen all of this. So please tell us what is messenger RNA and what is it doing in these vaccines? So as I just mentioned, messenger RNA is not in itself new technology. Um, this is something it's that- It's not new technology. Well, messenger RNA vaccines are new technology, but messenger RNA itself, what the vaccine is actually made of is not. Um, as I just said, as we just discussed, um, messenger RNA is a fundamental part of how your cells work. Um, your cells would not function without messenger RNA. So the idea behind messenger RNA vaccines um, is that they are encoding uh, a protein that's on the surface of the virus particle, which is what those antibodies that we were just discussing will recognize. Normally, if you were exposed to SARS coronavirus 2, you would have antibodies um, that would recognize the spike protein that's on the surface of the virus particle. And this is important um, in terms of understanding how these vaccines work, because antibodies will bind the spike protein, again, that's on the surface of the virus particle. And if they bind it in the right spot, what's called the RBD or the receptor binding domain, that will prevent the virus from being able to infect a cell. Um, mm -hmm. So that normally happens with your immune system if you are infected. If you have COVID, this process will occur um, but it won't occur necessarily right when you are exposed to the virus. So the point of vaccines is to basically give your immune system a heads up that it might be encountering this spike protein. 
Uh, and that way your immune system will be able to respond to it right away and you might not get infected. And if you do get infected, then you might not have as severe of disease as you would if you had uh, this lag in protection that normally happens the first time you're exposed to a given virus. So these antibody or these vaccines are working basically by putting messenger RNA that encodes the spike protein into your so cells. So when you say encodes, what does that mean? Encodes the spike protein. It's basically telling the protein making machinery of your cells how to make spike protein. And so then your cells will make the spike protein, but they're not making virus because the rest of the virus isn't even there. They're just making the spike protein. Then that spike protein gets secreted from those cells that it's being produced in. It binds those antibodies that are floating around just waiting to find their perfect match. So it's when like it, fooling it. It's like it, a trick. It's fooling your immune system into thinking that you have COVID but you actually don't. And there's no virus present. Um, it's just making the one protein that your immune system will respond to really effectively. The next time you are exposed to the actual virus, your immune system will be ready for it and it will keep you from getting infected or keep you from getting very sick. So why do people think messenger RNA will alter your DNA permanently? Why are they saying that? I think that that has to do with the fact that messenger RNA is a similar molecule to DNA. Um, there's, you know, a very minor biochemical difference between RNA and DNA. Um, one of them, DNA is deoxy deoxyribonucleic acid. RNA is ribonucleic acid. Um, it, it has to do with a, a biochemical group that's in a certain spot on the molecule. Um, so they're very closely related molecules, but they do different things. Um, and as I was mentioning before with our factory analogy, if the DNA is a foreman sitting in a separate room from everything else, including the machinery that makes proteins, messenger RNA doesn't go into that room. Um, so there is no way for a messenger RNA vaccine to actually get into the foreman's room and do something to the foreman. Um, it's a one-way street in terms of those messages coming out of the foreman's office, but nobody's allowed to go in there. So wow. when you give somebody a messenger RNA vaccine, it's going to make the protein, but it's not going to actually go in and interfere with your DNA and change you genetically. And that's important because it makes the protein that's going to trick the body into thinking it has been exposed to coronavirus. That's right. And also, this is really important. Um, one thing that is really just a pain for all people who work in the lab with RNA is that it's a very unstable molecule. So it doesn't, that, mean? that means that it doesn't hang around for a long time. It's going to go in there. Um, I heard one of my colleagues compared it, and I love this analogy, to a Snapchat message. It's going to go in there, and you can see that your body's going to make spike protein for just a little bit, and then you know, it's gone. It's going to, it's going to disappear into the ether. It's going to degrade and there won't be any more of it. Um, and so your immune system will respond to the spike protein that gets made while that mRNA is there, but it's not going to stick around for very long. Um, and once it's gone, you'll stop making that spike protein, but your immune system will have remembered that it, there was that spike protein there and it's going to take it away. And I saw that somebody just asked why the booster shot. That's exactly why, because it is so short lived that it may be that one shot, one exposure isn't enough. So you need to give the immune system a heads up with the first shot. And then you need to say, hey, immune system, like you need to really think about the possibility that you're going to encounter this in the real world someday so let me just send you a second Snapchat message and remind you um, so that you really know what you're going to be dealing with. I love that. You know, metaphors, I think, and these comparisons are really what bring it home. It's so interesting to me that there's so much misinformation out there about messenger RNA. People are scaring folks saying, uh, you know, that you, they're gonna, there's gonna be long-term effects. You know, women will be infertile. It can cause cancer. Your DNA will never be the same. But I think these metaphors you're offering about 
the foreman in the cell and the foreman is dictating everything and cannot come in contact with the messenger RNA. And the fact that it disappears uh, very quickly, like how long does it stick around? Are we talking a few days? Are we talking a few weeks? It probably depends on the person to a certain degree and the dose, but um, probably no more than a couple days. Yeah, okay. I have a, a couple of questions. I have to put on my glasses to read these though. Um, I think we actually answered most of these. It's about um, genetic coding up. Does mRNA, mRNA interfere with the genetic coding of your cells? It sounds like you answered that. Um, could it go beyond its initial intent and create DNA issues or fertility issues? It sounds like you just answered that unless you have something else to add. Yeah, the only thing um, I would add about the fertility issues is that these um, are being given by an intramuscular shot, so a shot in your arm. Um, there are no reproductive organs in your arm, fortunately, um, and the, the mRNA in these is going into pretty much the tissue that's there at the site of injection. So it's not, you know, if you're a woman, it's not going anywhere near your ovaries. If you're a man, it's not going anywhere near your testes. Um, it's not likely to even get anywhere near the organs that are involved in fertility um, or making what are called uh, what are called gametes or sperm and eggs. Um, you know, the, the parts of the cells in your body that are actually used to pass on your genetic information to your offspring. So even if there were a chance that the mRNA were able to get into that foreman's room, it's not in the right kind of cells um, where it would actually be potentially passed down. Um, it's not anywhere near any organs that are involved in reproduction. So um, I think that the, the likelihood of having any kind of fertility problems from this is extremely, extremely low. And of course, we don't know that because we haven't looked at these particular vaccines in people for a very long period of time. But I think as far as potential uh, harms that could come from these vaccines, the idea of fertility problems as a result is extremely unlikely. Yeah, okay. So let's talk about Operation Warp Speed a bit right now. You know, the name alone is enough to engender distrust and skepticism. But I, you know, we ask for miracle cures all the time. We ask for scientific advancements. And I think that's what we're, we're, we're looking at. This is a scientific advancement. We're not recognizing it because it's shrouded in so much, um, I don't know, confusion. So can you, I th first of all, let me say, I think Operation Warp Speed or the vaccine has come to us so quickly for a lot of reasons, including elimination of a lot of, a lot of the bureaucratic hassles at the federal level, um, very rapid enrollment of people in the trials. Um, so I think there, there are reasons to explain why it's going fast, but I think the biggest reason people are distrustful is because they don't understand how it's taken us so long to acquire or, or discover vaccines for things like HIV. And then here we are with this messenger RNA. We're saying it's new. It's not new. But how has all the work that's been done on messenger RNA years before now enabled us to speed up this process? Because I think that's the piece that's missing. Yeah, so this is a great question, and this is something that, um, first of all, I would say I totally agree with you that Operation Warp Speed itself as a name is terrible. Um, I think that it was probably chosen because it suggests that we're using technology to leap ahead um, in terms of our innovation, but I think the impression that a lot of people has got, have gotten from that is that corners are being cut. and. Therefore, we aren't going to be able to tell if these vaccines are safe um, or efficacious or you know, effective. Um, I think that what people should understand is that Operation Warp Speed has been primarily um, focused on distribution and manufacturing of these vaccines and not actually mm. evaluating them for safety or efficacy. Um, this is a, a really important point for people to get because normally, you know, the vaccine process, we've all heard that it takes decades sometimes. Um, it takes years at the very least. Um, and so how did this one happen in less than a year? 
Um, one of the reasons it can take so long is that usually the, the various parts of the clinical trial process occur sequentially, so one after the other. Um, in this case, some parts of the vaccine uh, development process were performed at the same time. So normally before a vaccine ever goes into a person, there are animal studies to just make sure that the technology itself is safe. Um, in this case, although mRNA vaccines have never been approved for clinical use, um, they have actually been tested for, for a while. They've been around for a while. They've just been experimental. Um, so cl phase one clinical trials, which strictly evaluate safety in people, have already been done with mRNA vaccines for other viruses. So we know that the technology itself is safe. Um, so that's why they decided to look at both the animal studies and the phase one studies at the same time. Of course, you have to confirm that this particular mRNA vaccine is safe as well. So they did do phase one trials. Um, they just did them at the same time that they do these animal studies, which normally happen before. Operation Warp Speed comes in on the other end of things. So normally a pharmaceutical company, after investing as much money as it takes, millions and millions of dollars to develop the vaccine and run all these clinical trials over the course of many years, um, will not start manufacturing the vaccine for clinical use until they actually get FDA approval. Because if they've already invested all this money in it, why would they invest potentially hundreds of millions of dollars more making a vaccine if the FDA is never going to approve it so that they can actually start vaccinating people with it. And this, this is such an important point here. People need to recognize how much time we gain by this, this issue you're raising right now. So continue. Yeah, so we saved months um, uh, of time in which it would take the, the manufacturers, if they weren't going to start manufacturing the vaccine until they got some sort of FDA approval, or in this case, authorization to start giving it to people, we'd be waiting months more while they actually started manufacturing it for, for people to use. Because the experimental vaccines um, that are used in animals or that are used to develop the vaccine are not manufactured um, to the same standard that things are when they're used in human patients. So you can manufacture a small amount for use in a clinical trial, but when you're manufacturing hundreds of millions of doses, that, that costs a lot of money because you have to do it in a way where you're, you're ensuring that those vaccines are safe, there's quality control to make sure that you're getting vaccinated with what you think you're getting vaccinated with, to make sure all the dosing is all right, to make sure that the containers themselves are sterile um, and say, so there's a lot of things that go into what are called good manufacturing practices or GMP manufacturing for clinical products. Um, so by investing in that manufacturing process, providing manufacturers with the funds to actually start manufacturing these vaccines for use in people before they're getting approval um, has, has really shaved months off of the, the scale of time that would normally be required. And it's really, really important for people to understand that that is where the majority of Operation Warp Speed funding has gone. Um, the other aspect of that is distribution. So these mRNA vaccines, as I said, mRNA is a, a pain of a molecule to work with because it, it's very unstable. So you have to keep it in extreme cold. Um, mm. You have to keep it colder than most other vaccines. And that's going to prevent present a huge distribution challenge. Um, most, most clinics and your, your local Walgreens or CVS does not have a minus 80 degrees Celsius freezer, um, which is what you need to, to store this vaccine for longer periods of time. So for people who don't have that in their communities, which are many, many communities in the US, um, it will have to be stored in dry ice or there has to be an effort to purchase these, these ultra cold freezers that will allow people to get large shipments of the vaccine and store them so that the vaccine will be good when you actually are vaccinating people. Um, this is a really big logistical challenge and that's where a lot of Operation Warp Speed's other funding has gone. It hasn't gone into just throwing money at the clinical trial process and making it go faster. Um, at the expense of getting good quality safety and efficacy data. And I will say that over the last, uh, 
I guess, day and a half, um, I have been reviewing the packets that um, Pfizer and BioNTech submitted to the FDA. Um, and I have to say, from my own perspective, really the only thing we've sacrificed in doing the trials uh, this quickly is an understanding of how long the protection will last from these vaccines. So what's called durability. And there's a question about that too. Yeah. So the, the, the short answer is that we don't know how durable these vaccines are. We don't know how long the protection will last. But I think that's okay in this, in this situation, um, partly because we could just have another booster shot um, if protection doesn't last for years and years and years. But we do have some data that suggests the, the protection does last for at least three months. Um, just understanding how the immune system works, knowing what we know about other vaccines, if something lasts for three months, it's probably going to last, I would say, conservatively for a year. Um, so we won't know that until, uh, until we start following people for longer periods of time. But right now, we're in a crisis situation. So we only actually need short-term protection right now urgently um, to get right. transmission under control, to get uh, the burden off of our hospital systems, which is, I think, going to be one of the biggest benefits of vaccination. Um, so we've sacrificed that, but based on all of the safety and efficacy data I've seen um, from this trial, which did include 40, over 40,000 participants, they collect safety data from all of those participants. Um, this vaccine is something that I would feel comfortable taking, um, and I would feel comfortable recommending it to my family, um, including my, my older parents, including uh, my kids, um, including- And is that because you felt like your parents were represented in the studies? Well, I do, and my parents aren't in the highest risk age group. Um, my, so my parents are in their late 60s, um, but my dad does have a heart condition. Um, I myself have asthma. Uh, and you know there are some there are some risks now. I think that representation is absolutely critical, and I'm happy to discuss that more. Um, these studies have please uh, do yeah yeah these trials um, did go a little bit slower because they did make a point to enroll people um, who are from racial groups that have been disproportionately affected by this pandemic. And this like is some people and like Hispanic black people, people. Yeah. and Hispanic people and indigenous people. Um, and I think that this is something that people really need to understand about why these groups are disproportionately affected, um, because it also really affects how we are going to increase vaccine confidence. Um, those groups are there is not a biological reason why black people have worse COVID-19 outcomes. The issue is that they are suffering from pervasive systemic health disparities. Um, a lack of access to health care, uh, other comorbidities that are the result of decades and even centuries of systemic racism. Um, and what's and a comorbidity? Examples of comorbidities? A comorbidity is another health condition that you have that increases your risk of severe COVID-19. So it is, not for, it is not because of DNA that people of color have worse outcomes. It is because of a, a differential lack of access to the same health care that white people have generally. Um, and and that's, we have higher rates of diabetes, heart disease, cancer, and so on, yeah. Precisely. Those are exactly those comorbidities that and I was obesity, referring to. You know, it turns out obesity seems to be one of the biggest risk factors. Is that right? So there's a, there's a big question about obesity because obesity is also associated with some of these other comorbidities. So. Right. Is it the obesity or is it the fact that you are obese and that has resulted in a heart condition or di type two diabetes? Right. Um, so there's, that's a very confusing one, um, but, and I, I don't think there's a clear answer. I've heard arguments um, to say that obesity alone is a risk factor and also um, arguments the other way saying that it's really incidental and because mm -hmm. obesity is associated with these other conditions. Okay. But the real key back to sort of the original topic we were talking about is that it's really critical to make sure that people from those communities are represented in the clinical trial because you want to make sure that people with these um, health conditions and, you know, health status is something that's very, very complicated. Um, it's different for people in every community. It's not the same for all black people across the country. It's not the same for all white people across the country. 
Um, it's going to be very person specific. It's going to be very community specific. It's going to be specific to somebody's socioeconomic status. So it's really important to get a very representative uh, population of participants in your clinical trial because you want a vaccine that's going to be protective regardless of who you are, where you come from. And so these vaccine trials actually had to slow down a little bit to make sure that they were enrolling a diverse group of participants, including older people, including people from uh, Black, Hispanic, and Indigenous communities. Um, and so, you know, that. Now, granted, efficacy is decided based on a few hundred cases. And those what are- What is efficacy? Efficacy is how well the vaccine works to protect you. So you may have heard there's, you know, this vaccine is 95% protective. Um, that's efficacy. And that's based on out of all the thousands of people who are in the trial, um, how many people got the placebo and got symptomatic COVID? Um, how many people got the vaccine and got symptomatic COVID? If you have fewer numbers of people in the vaccinated group that got COVID compared to the people who got the placebo, then that's an efficacious or effective vaccine. The vaccine works. Um, and so that's how they decide that. But as I mentioned, they also look at safety and they look at safety regardless of whether people got COVID or not. So um, I think that one of the things that gives me more, more confidence is that there were uh, diverse groups of people, including older people, including uh, people of color, included in these trials, and they were represented in all of these groups. Um, so it's safe for everybody. It's efficacious for everybody. And they did break it down into subgroups. So they looked, for example, at antibody production and at protection in older people. And we all know that older people, regardless of race or background, are at a much higher risk of COVID-19. Um, it, it turned out that the vaccine is pretty much just as protective in older people as it is oh, wow. in younger people. So, um, you know, there's, there's these things called confidence intervals, which is like plus or minus, basically. And so it was a little bit less efficacious when you just looked at the older people. Um, but, but still, you know, above 90%, um, that's, that's incredible. Um, that suggests that it, it's, you know what it is because I'm hearing questions about, uh, you know, people pushing back about giving or uh, prioritizing, uh, older people when there are so many people with chronic health conditions, because we do know usually older people don't have as great a response to vaccines. So that's really great news. And I think their point is, well, if older people don't respond well to vaccines, why are we giving it to them? We should be giving it to, you know, people who are, are dying, you know, at the highest rates. Um, so that's really great news. It's fantastic news. Um, and I will say that, you know, distributing the vaccine, prioritizing who gets it first, that's a really complicated topic. And I, I'm the first to say I'm not a bioethicist. So while I have opinions, because um, that's I, what it is, really, it's about rationing. We, 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 that's a dirty word in our country, but that's but you what know, this is because we don't have enough vaccines for everybody. We don't have enough vaccines. We also don't have enough health care. And right now, health care is being rationed um, in many communities that that are, you know, suffering under a really high burden of COVID in the hospitals. Um, so what, no matter in an ideal world we would have equal access immediately for everybody. Um, and I think that at least the Biden administration has been talking about this a lot. This long term is a really important uh, thing th that we need to be discussing. Once the vaccine is available for everybody, we need to make sure that people are getting equal access to it, um, regardless of who you are, of what kind of job you do, of what risk group you're in. Um, but for these initial vaccine doses, I mean, I think everybody agrees frontline healthcare workers uh, should get it. Yeah, absolutely. But, but then the question becomes, you know, okay, so then who else gets it? Is it essential workers, um, non-healthcare essential workers, which yeah, I think there's a, a very strong argument to be made for very that as well. Argument. I think that yeah. people in long-term care, you know, some of this to a certain degree may just have to do with logistics. Um, it's going to be easier to vaccinate more people in long-term care um, because they are already in facilities where it's going to be much easier to distribute the vaccine there. Um, but to a certain degree, and people should also understand this, that the panel of uh, ethicists and scientists and physicians that made these recommendations about prioritization just made recommendations. 
Um, it's going to be up to individual state governors and sometimes local health officials to decide how the vaccines that they get are actually going to be allocated in their communities. And in some communities, that may mean that there are fewer long-term care facilities. So you start giving it to essential workers or other vulnerable groups as well um, in that, that first batch of vaccines. So this is yeah. really a dynamic and flexible system. Um, it's not set in stone, but you're right. It is rationing um, because unfortunately we have no other choice right now. Well, what's interesting to me though about prioritizing um, nursing home residents is they live in the nursing home. So who's giving them coronavirus? It's the workers, it's the people who are coming in. So, you know, there's a responsibility. We each have a responsibility not to spread coronavirus. And so it's very interesting that instead of focusing on preventing the workers from bringing coronavirus into the facility, they would uh, prioritize them um, as one of the highest risk groups based on that. So I think we need to spend more time uh, understanding how is it that people who work in nursing homes are still bringing coronavirus uh, into the facility? Are they not recognizing their symptoms? Are they refusing to stay home? Uh, so lot, still more questions there. Um, yeah, I, I think there's... Keep you, I don't want to keep oh, you all night though, so... Yeah, no <laughs> worries. Is, I think you, yeah. I was just going to make a quick little comment about that. Um, there's, I think, a couple reasons. One is because community transmission is out of control throughout the entire country right now. And so there's only so much people can do, even if they are being very careful to protect themselves um, from being exposed. Um, another is that there, you know, people have different degrees. And at this point, 11 months into the pandemic, um, I mean, I don't know about you, but I'm certainly fatigued by the pandemic and oh, yes. it's, we're all tired of it, including yes. me. And, you know, I, I've been fitted for an N95 mask. I have an N95 mask that I wear um, when I go out, when I have to go out, I'm fortunate enough to be able to stay at home most of the time. Um, but not everybody is, I mean, people have to pay rent. People have to put food on the table. Um, people need to go to work. And uh, so people are given the levels of transmission in the community, even no, no matter how careful people are, they might still be exposed. And I yeah. think that's a lot of how this is happening. Um, if we really want to protect um, people really in long-term care facilities or in any type of business, we need to get community transmission down overall. And the final reason is that um, it's not because people aren't reporting their symptoms necessarily. I mean, there are some cases where that happens, but we know that a lot of the transmission that occurs, occurs before people even know that they're sick. Um, they don't have symptoms and there's a substantial amount of pre-symptomatic transmission, which I think is why this pandemic has been so difficult to control. Um, yeah. People don't know that they're exposed because they're exposed to other people who don't know that they're sick. Then they themselves become infected and they begin spreading it and transmitting it to others before they know that they are sick. So it's really a combination of sort of a perfect storm of, of factors that I think are driving this community transmission. It all comes back though to your original point about leadership. Without a coherent central leadership strategy um, and providing support to people so that they can make themselves as safe as possible, it's really, people are really not able to um, avoid putting themselves in situations that are going to uh, foster more community transmission. And I feel very strongly that, you know, a lot of these conversations, and not you, Lisa, but um, many people talk about this as blaming people for irresponsible behavior. Um, but I think that's really stigmatizing. And I think that doesn't really address the, the root of the problem, which is that people are confused. They don't always know what to do. And they don't always have an option to to just stay home and sit right. in the, the little nook off their dining room and talk on right. Facebook live chats into the press all day. Yeah. Um, people or actually if they have, don't to... have sick leave. They won't exactly. get paid if they don't go to work. Yeah. Exactly. And how do you ask somebody to quarantine if they don't know that they've been exposed and they don't have access to testing and they don't have paid sick leave? How do you ask them to, to put their livelihoods and their families at risk um, because it's the right thing to do? Um, most people just can't do that despite the fact that I think many people want to do the right thing. Most people mm -hmm. want to do the right thing. Um, so it's a, it's a really huge problem, but I think that now that these vaccines are approved, um, you know, we've got another really powerful tool for ending the pandemic for good. 
So um, I'm really, really grateful, well, Lisa, I for the opportunity I, to talk to. I don't know how long it's going, the protection will last, right? But I, I want to pivot, though, because you, you brought up a lot of points that are a great segue for me to ask you your opinion about masks. You know, they've become a, not just a political statement, but very controversial. And, you know, people send me videos and want me to watch, you know, um, uh, these commentaries about how it's not based on science and the data are not compelling and one study say that's that's science period you can you know yesterday we heard that coffee is bad for you the next you know tomorrow we're going to hear it's good for you so science is not perfect but what can you tell people about wearing masks because it seems like even if we don't know 100 percent if it works like what have we got to lose what's the alternative we've got to get out of this so what's your your feeling about the masks so this is something that has really bothered me through the entire pandemic and that is that people really want black or white definitive answers on everything um, and they tend to think that that masks either work completely 100 percent, or they don't work at all um, and the reality is something in the middle so risk reduction is additive. Masks work. Masks work even better if you're also able to physically distance from somebody. That works even better if you're also able to ventilate the space that you're in. And that works even better if you're able to avoid crowded gatherings. That works good even point. better still if you're washing your hands and practicing good hand hygiene. That works even better still if you get sick and you have symptoms and you're able to stay home. So all of these things stacked on top of each other are, are what are really going to be helpful, I think. And there is a, there's a graphic going around um, the Swiss cheese model. Um, and if you think of it as different layers of Swiss cheese, all with holes in different places, you know, you might have virus getting through one of the holes. Let's say you're wearing the first, the first slice of cheese is a mask. So you've got some virus getting through there. The next slice of cheese is social distancing. Maybe there's two holes right next to each other and so it's still getting right through. On. The next one is a vaccine and you know then then you come to a place where there's no hole and so the virus stops. And if you look at this over mass, social distancing, staying home, avoiding crowds, all of these different non-pharmaceutical interventions, you add vaccines to that too, um, you're going to get to a point where you've reduced risk so much that it really does have a meaningful effect on transmission. Um, and long, awesome. I'd say long term vaccines, if we can get transmission down using these other measures with vaccines and eventually convince enough people to get vaccinated that we reach what's called the herd immunity threshold in which people, enough people are immune to the virus that it can't spread anymore in the population. That's how we're going to end this for good. Yeah. So just a few more questions for you. Um, does coronavirus mutate and if so does it make the it does it make COVID 19 worse so yes it mutates um and this is something that people should also understand most of the times when viruses mutate um that's a normal feature that's viruses virusing um they they mutate every <laughs> time and virusing. i like that and they, they mutate every time they they reproduce um their genomes so every time they copy their I'm genetic sorry, that material. Was big, that was a big sentence. Every yeah. time they reproduce their genome, every, every time they copy themselves, they make a mistake. Is that what exactly you're every okay. time they copy themselves, they make a mistake. And you can think of this as, you know, if you're writing the same sentence over and over again, like Bart Simpson, um, at you know the beginning of every Simpsons episode, like I will not blah blah blah. Um, let's just say <laughs> that he misspells something every time he copies that. That's a mutation. Um, Sometimes those mutations can be corrected. Uh, in viruses like coronaviruses, they do have the ability to correct uh, those mistakes some of the time, um, but sometimes they don't correct it. And when that persists and it gets copied into the next sentence, that's a mutation. Oftentimes, a uh, mutation has no effect whatsoever. Um, sometimes it actually has a bad effect on the virus. And this, this happens pretty frequently too where it will happen in a place that's critical for the virus to, to carry out its virus responsibilities. Um, and that causes that mutation to essentially go away because if the virus can't replicate itself, if it can't copy itself, um, then that mutation's not gonna persist. 
um, occasionally it, a mutation will occur that makes the virus replicate itself or copy itself more efficiently. Um, sometimes that can lead to certain properties that we find undesirable. For example, it can become more contagious. It can become uh, more easily transmitted. It can affect different types of tissues. Um, it can become more pathogenic or cause more severe disease. Um, but there's no evidence that any of the mutations that have been reported so far for this virus are causing any of those things to happen. Awesome. There's been one mutation. It's in the spike protein, which I was talking about earlier that antibodies are made to. Fortunately, it's not in a part of the spike protein that antibodies recognize. So it's not going to have any effect on how well vaccines work. Um, it may confer what's called a fitness advantage, where it makes the virus just a little bit better at copying itself. And that may cause the virus to be transmitted a little more efficiently, but it's not at all clear that that is making the pandemic worse or really having any meaningful effect whatsoever. So people should rest assured that um, while the virus can mutate, and it's something that obviously myself and my colleagues who, who work on that aspect of the virus specifically are keeping an eye on um, something that's called surveillance, which we're going to need to do anyways with this virus. Um, mm -hmm. there's, no, there's no indication so far that any of the mutations that have been reported are having an effect either in terms of immune responses or in terms of the virus somehow getting worse. Yeah. So why are, why are we hearing this language about the messenger RNA putting chips in people? Like, where is that coming from? I have no idea because um, there's definitely no microchips I involved in an mRNA vaccine um, at all. I think some of that has to do with uh, sort of conspiracy theories that have been around for a long time, um, suggesting mm -hmm. that long before the pandemic, people have suggested that vaccines are actually a secret plot to put microchips in people. Um, and early on in the pandemic, for reasons that are still somewhat baffling to me, this has been associated with 5G wireless technology. Um, and that yeah. has no effect whatsoever on how vaccines work. Um, so I think some of this is just kind of these conspiracy theories, these ideas that have been floating around for a long time, um, and they sort of get remade or repurposed uh, for this pandemic specifically. But I can assure all of your, uh, your viewers um, and the people that follow you that there are no microchips in any of the vaccine technologies that are being evaluated, at least in phase three trials, um, including the Pfizer and Moderna mRNA vaccines. Yeah, because guess what? If I was, if I got the vaccine, I, I certainly don't think I have a chip in me. Not to mention if the chips, the purpose of the chips are to track people and spy on us, you know, these devices, our email accounts, I mean, Anytime we're interacting with technology, like why would it take a vaccine for people to spy on us and track us? So um, I think people need to really think about these things before they spread the information. Yeah, um, and I think I honestly think it also gives um, gives the government way too much credit. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think that that doing something like that, if it took us 11 months to to actually make these vaccines and just get them to a few vulnerable people at first. Um, I think that suggesting that it's all part of some larger plot to to spy on us or to conduct, you know, microchip surveillance with technology that I'm not aware exists. Um, I think that's that's really uh, giving giving the government way too much credit um, yeah. for for their abilities. Or anybody else, whether I heard it's linked to Bill Gates too, but I, I think the, the only reason I'm raising it is because I hope this conversation has helped people realize that there is a scientific basis for what's happening right now. Regardless of how fast the process has been, we can explain that by the advancements in technology before uh, this pandemic happened. As you said, MRA, mRNA is not new. It's been studied before, but this is the first time we were able to put it in a vaccine. And then that coupled with the government buying the the vaccine production. I mean, that's a huge thing. So um, I, I just, uh, are you having trouble with your camera there? I only have one more question. No, I, I, I had to, I I had to plug my phone in. Time, but it's, 
Oh, <laughs> well, I just have one more question. We're about to go, and you've been so generous with your time. We've been on here for over an hour, but I, I think um, you've been so helpful to people. And I knew you would be when I heard you. Like, I can, I can spot it. Um, well, it's this question about liability. It's not really a scientific question, but um, in your conversations uh, about um, the vaccine, Operation Warp Speed, and so on, People are concerned, and again, this is in the bucket of distrust. People are concerned that the vaccine, the vaccine developers and the drug companies are getting a pass. They are not going to be held accountable if there are side effects two and three years from now. So basically they're exempt from any uh, liability or litigation. Um, I don't, and to be honest, I don't really know how I feel about that. I mean, it, it's a risky venture to develop a new medication, a new vaccine, any treatment. I mean, we demand treatments and that they come at a cost. So um, what, what are your thoughts about that? Um, should we be holding them um, or should they be at risk for liability if something happens, you know, two years from now? Like if I grow, you know, a six finger three years from now because I had the vaccine. So of course that's an outrageous well, example, but you know what I mean? Yeah, I do know what you mean. Um, and this is actually something that's been a, a problem um, and a concern throughout the entire history of vaccine development in the modern era. Um, so ever since, you know, Jonas Salk uh, developed the polio vaccine, the first polio vaccine, um, you know, manufacturers have been concerned about um, being sued and often for new vaccines, manufacturers have to be subsidized by the government to actually produce them because they're decidedly unprofitable. Um, so there's also this protection against lawsuits, but only to a certain degree. The exemptions don't cover manufacturers for being negligent. Um, they, they do, there is a vaccine, uh, the vaccine adverse events I don't remember what the R stands for system, the, the VAERS court or the so-called vaccine court that compensates people from the government if they are injured by a vaccine. So people should know that there is a recourse um, in terms of if they, if they do experience a vaccine injury, they don't have to sue the manufacturers because they can be compensated by the government who addresses this. Um, if a manufacturer is really bad, if they're a bad actor, um, then, then they can be held liable because this exemption from uh, civil litigation only covers uh, the, the side effects from the vaccines themselves. The manufacturer is not making the vaccine correctly. If they, um, you know, package something else uh, that they say is the vaccine, um, anything like that, they can still be held liable for. So, uh, so people should rest assured that it's not as though the manufacturers have gotten a completely free pass and they've gotten all this money to, to just sort of take and enjoy and like light cigars with hundred dollar bills with, um, they, they can still be held liable for severe negligence and there are mechanisms to compensate people should they be injured by a vaccine. But people should also understand that really, really severe vaccine injuries like that are extremely rare. Um, and normally those are not detected until vaccines go out into the whole population because they're so rare that you won't detect them in a phase three clinical trial, including one that involves tens of thousands of participants. These are one in a million, one in two million type events. Um, but for those people, as much as that is terrible, um, there is a, a mechanism with the government to compensate people for that. Excellent. Well, Dr. Angela Rasmussen, did I say that right? You did. Thank you so much for keeping it real, down to earth. I love the metaphors. Um, I even learned some things from you about how to communicate about some of these scientific principles. Um, so do you have any last words before we go? Well, right back at you. And I'm just really, really grateful to have the opportunity to talk with you about this. I learned a lot from you too. And it's really great to talk to somebody who is very knowledgeable and also keeps me accountable for the entire audience. Because no matter how hard I try, sometimes I, you know, I can't help talking we about all do it. nuclear I localization do it and cytoplasm sometimes. <laughs> um, so, 
So thank you for, for keeping me on point and just really for having this great discussion. Um, it's really a privilege to be able to communicate with, with your followers and to, to chat with you too. Yeah, and thank you so much for your work. So everybody, thanks for tuning in. And uh, this was an amazing discussion. So you can also follow uh, Dr. Angie on Twitter uh to see what she's up to so thank you guys very much if you have more questions just leave them below and we'll get back to you so thanks a lot dr angie good night thank you good night lisa take care dr